Let's keep in touch, let's keep in touch, keep in touch with me. Drop me a line any old time, you know that I'll be free on song. Hi, I'm Mel. And I'm Amy. Welcome to Talk to Us at Bounce English. Hey Mel, who do we have with us today? Today we have Caroline McKinnon, who I would consider basically a legend. Uh, Caroline is just an incredible personality. I mean, I uh, met Caroline, gosh, almost 20 years ago when we were teachers at Malvern House, which feels like an eternity ago. But Caroline very quickly distinguished herself because she was just such an amazing teacher. Everybody was talking about her all the time. And she quickly rose through the ranks to become academic director there, which was no small feat considering it was um, a very large language school. I think the largest language school in London at the time. So that was pretty impressive. And um, she put together an incredible team of academics, which I might say because I was one of them. Um, I actually still very fondly remember those team meetings because they are the only meetings I ever attended where I was delighted when they ran long because we just always had so much fun together and they inevitably ended in the pub. But uh, now Caroline, is currently the teacher training director at Renard College NYC. Do I have that right, Caroline? Is that your title? I'm, yeah, it doesn't really matter, but I'm director of courses at Renard International. And probably more importantly, more most impressively, has is the director of Felt NYC, which is an organization that was founded to help female asylum seekers in New York City learn English. And that's grown from serving 500 students um, just in New York, or serving one student to serving 500 and doing all sorts of different things now. So that's no small feat, I would say. Um, felt has really grown. What would you, how would you describe Felt now? Because I feel like it, it definitely does more than, than just teach English, just. Yeah, um, well, firstly, it's no longer for women only, um, which has been a huge change for us. We now are genderless and we also are open to all age groups. We have a very strong kids program. And I would say that now our main goal is to address the inequity in education, especially among immigrant and refugee um, families. Very important. And I think, especially right now, so important. This has been a difficult time for anybody who is in the English language teaching industry, but I think perhaps especially so for those who teach immigrants and of course uh, immigrants and their families, because this has been uh, just a really hostile period uh, for them, at least in the United States. So hopefully we can talk a little bit more about that. But um, I think I'll start by asking you, how are you doing today? I'm doing good, thank you. Um, I'm writing a quiz for the staff at our school to do a holiday quiz. Um, and I'm enjoying myself because I'm doctoring photos of everybody and they don't know it. <laughs> well, that's that's very fun. How are you? Well, we're talking about doing um, like a, a ELT teacher quiz where she just would do uh, abbreviations or acronyms for various <laughs> things because there's so many acronyms in ELT. It's true. We talk about them all the time and we get confused about them the whole time, you know, but we still know who's talking about what, you know, and especially <laughs> well, when it comes to teach training that we're using all of this sort of PPP and ECRIF and, you know, all these things that mean perfect sense, make perfect sense to us, but maybe Once you get outside. used to them, TTT, PPP, ESP, EAP, the PPP, uh, there's a lot. <laughs> <laughs> there are a lot, definitely a lot. <laughs> Uh, no, I'm, I'm feeling great. I'm so happy to talk to you. Um, and I'm so happy that you yeah. agreed to take part in this. So as I said, you know, Caroline, when I think about you, I always just think of like personality, enthusiasm, magnetism, you know, like people notice you, you are a presence, I feel in this field. And I'd love it if you could tell us a little bit about your background, kind of how you got into English language teaching and to where you are now. I know that's, no. a, that's a big ask, <laughs> you know. It's um, actually, everything comes down in my life. Everything comes down to um, 
laziness and opportunity basically you know I mean I would I'd love to tell you that I had this grand career plan but I didn't I before I got into teaching I went to college I lived in South America I worked in ski resorts I worked for the BBC um it was all about travel and just having a good time really and when I was at college I was studying Spanish and you had to spend your third year in a Spanish-speaking country and because um you know my family live in the south of France and really on the border of Spain so going to Spain to me was just like this really like you know why would I go to Spain so I threw my um hat into the ring to go to Latin America for a year and they gave me a placement in Mexico and I was so excited about it like to go to Mexico for a year and three weeks before I was due to go to Mexico I got a phone call from the British Council because it was through them and they said actually we've oversubscribed Mexico will you go to Ecuador and I said sure no problem put down the phone I remember screaming to my mom where the is Ecuador and we were like looking up on a map you know and yeah three weeks later I was um in Quito and to spend if you went to Spain you studied the language you went to college if you went to South America you taught so I was teaching at the British Council teaching kids and teenagers really really enjoyed it didn't go into teaching when when I came back went into tourism and um, media and then got made redundant and decided to get some formal training for teaching couldn't get into a place and my father was like no nobody says they're full to my daughter I made a few phone calls and suddenly I was on the training call starting like two days later straight out of the training call applied for one job at Malvern House and got it you know so my it's been this like this happy coincidences and happy accidents the whole way I come from a family that's truly international you know it's like where we quite often like say for example like my my father only speaks English that's it you know he's a typical English speaker um and there are other members of the family that only speak certain languages but we like forget what language we're even communicating in until somebody points out to us that you know are you guys speaking German are you guys speaking French just because that's you know whatever happens um so I've always been around different nationalities different language skills I guess that there's a certain thing when you grow up in that kind of household that brings you towards teaching in some ways or understanding that language is not that easy for everybody I was certainly aware of the fact that everybody everybody spoke English and that, that the people in the British side of the family never had to bother speaking anything else because everyone understood us you just needed to speak slower and louder <laughs> that kind of idea so then I started at Malvern House and I realized that it was the creativity that I really liked about teaching um and by that I mean I love teaching I I love every aspect of it but just sitting and working from somebody else's uh textbook was kind of boring but if I could then use a song that would illustrate the same point that would be so much more fun and if I could play a game around it or if I can make my students laugh not in a sort of clown way but if they could forget that they were actively learning and just have fun in the classroom it was like this kind of buzz that I would get from teaching itself and unlike many people around me I think I you know I love the challenge of having a different level each time or suddenly like yeah. teaching here's a beginner's yeah. class or here's a you know and, and I know not not everybody is like that but I hate to get bored myself and I like to be able yeah. to try out different things and yeah I hadn't been teaching that long when they asked me to take over well they didn't I know it's, it's confusing really they asked me to train up to be an academic assistant to to this guy a Canadian guy called Chris who was very very traditionally academic you know everything was about labeling it was about whether a student could recognize the like schwa by they could label it that way I mean he was fantastic academically but it was complete different style of academia to me um and I had to do like this crash course in, in masters of linguistics I was doing at the same time and then just as I was about to be trained up he quit and our boss at this time who was big on drinks said let's go to the pub and he was just like so I think I need you to take over the academic team um 
And it went from there. We ended up having three schools. There were Mel's, you're right. We were the largest language school in the UK, I think, not just, um, but certainly in London. We had a very small team of really, I, I, you know, it was great for me to be able to pick people who brought all different skills. We had very analytical people on the team and we had people like Melanie or Rich who were the really creative people on the team. You know, so we had this whole mix going on and just a good bunch of people who cared about their students. And people used to always ask why we would all ha always hang out socially, you know. It's, and to me, it's like, well, because we all had the same attitudes towards our classes, you know, and there's no coincidence that you gravitate towards people who have the same kind of fun as you. And we, I mean, we had a lot of fun. It wasn't just all about teaching. You know, I still, to this day, I still remember that we spent hours writing a music quiz in the pub one time, but we forgot to write down the answers anywhere and none of us could remember <laughs> half of them. Uh, <laughs> so it was really through there and it's just, I became more and more excited about um pronunciation in particular and then I discovered trauma-informed training years ago didn't really kind of know what it was but my my parents are foster parents and so there was always that term going around as well you know but I didn't quite link it to language training at all and I think really it was um when I was first here in New York I was running a center and a student came in to me one day and just burst into tears and I'd known this student for a long time and he had missed a lot of classes you know um and he said to me I don't want you to call me he anymore I'm I'm a girl I've been a girl my entire life I've just received a letter today that proved um that allows me to legally have the operation etc and she became my favorite student because for the first time she introduced me to this idea that education for her was a way of escaping repression in her own country um, and to run away from the trauma that she had received and to finally be in a place where that trauma could be spoken about openly, not always accepted, but openly. And it really made me realize that education serves a much bigger purpose than just teaching you about a language or something um and it just took me on this path I think and then I went through the immigration process myself which was an eye-opener because my entire way through it people said to me why do you want to become an American but why you're British you know what advantage is there people opened doors to me people laughed about it I was there was one point where I was undocumented they didn't care because I'm British and I'm white and at the same time I was teaching students who were fighting and they'd been here for 25 years and that led me to where I am now really yeah and that that process that going through the immigration process I mean I've gone through it. Well, I've gone through it myself as an immigrant in the UK. I've also gone through it sort of in the UAE. It's slightly different, but you do have to do a lot of paperwork. And then of course, because my husband's British, we went through it so he could get his green card here. And I can definitely say that the process here, I, I don't know, the UK process isn't great either, but um, it's, a really long, complicated, difficult process. And that is for people for whom English is the first language and we're white and we're privileged. You know, I mean, so then put yourself in the shoes of someone who does not speak English as their first language or uh, is from and or is from a quote unquote undesirable country. It's a really difficult experience so so now you are running felt do you want to tell us a little bit tell our listeners a little bit about uh felt what it is yeah uh, um i think you talked a little bit about your inspiration for it yeah i mean actually my inspiration i've been teaching immigrants at that point but they were still immigrants who could afford education you know they this was through uh, a college so they were working hard and studying hard you know to try and get a better life and then the election happened and, you know, education in general. Uh, 2016, right? 2016, 2020, yeah. yeah. No, 2016. 
And students became nervous. They were coming from countries that suddenly were put on targeted lists. They didn't know what their future was going to be like. And there was a period of time where actually trying to teach a class, you couldn't because something would happen and a student would be worried or a student wouldn't attend class because they were worried about their own status or, you know, somebody had been picked up by ICE in their building and they might be legal, but they were still worried, you know. And it just made me really quite angry. And... I was, um, you know, with my friends, we were very active politically here in, in New York and we were going on every protest possible and donating to every fund possible. And it doesn't, it's not real change. It's very easy to throw money at something if you've got money, right? But if you don't have money, then you kind of, um, you're left out of that process. You know, it's really easy to be ethical if you've got the money to buy ethically, right? This is my whole thing. And as a teacher, of course, I don't fall into the 1%, certainly not here in New York City. So I was a bit frustrated because I couldn't keep, I couldn't sustain that every night going out and protesting and donating. And I actually started by a Facebook rant where I said, well, you know, the only thing I know what I can, that I can do is teach. Um, so I'm going to sort, find a community that doesn't have the resources and offer my services. At the time, I will say very much white savior, look at me right? can admit it now. But what happened was the Facebook status took on a life of its own. And my friends around me, teachers and fellow educators were like, well, if you're doing that, I want in, I'll come and teach as well. And if you're, you know, and it just snowballed and snowballed and snowballed until we got contacted by a school, well, actually by Renner, who I work for now. And um, they said, look, we have these beautiful space in Manhattan it's free to, for you at the weekend you know it was like the top of the oh, line school that's amazing we were like, it was amazing absolutely amazing they've been great since the start but what we didn't take into account and this comes back to the white savior thing is we thought you know if we build it they will come but our students were too scared to come into Manhattan you know they couldn't afford to come into Manhattan as well it was this unknown for them as foreign as anything you could possibly imagine so we had like one or two students who would venture in but not many but every time we were about to give up we would have somebody say like one of the students called Felicitas who's in all of our publicity because four years later she's still with us she's gorgeous she's lovely and every time we were just like this is not working we're doing something wrong she would say these classes are amazing. They're fine. Finally, I've got something for myself. And you'd be like, this is why I'm doing it. So we stuck with it. And through a friend um, who was doing some work with children, we were put in contact with a school in East Harlem in one of the, the poorer areas that had a high immigrant population. And we spoke to them and we ended up opening classes within their school where the mothers, the kids were in classes and it was mothers could come directly where their kids were there. And from that, it kind of just, we learned. We quickly got over this idea of saving the world. We weren't saving the world at all. And in fact, ESL wasn't even a priority to them. Literacy was the priority. Working out how to fill in a form for the doctor, et cetera. You know, it was a real, we came crashing down, but we had to. Yeah, and you know, it's funny because I think that there's some parallels to like entrepreneurship that you're describing and to starting a, you know, a new business where you're like, I have this idea and this is, we're going to do so much for people, but it, you know, you have to sometimes pivot and change and learn, especially if you're building yeah. something from nothing, which by the way, is completely amazing um, what you've been talking about. Thank and you. I think, you know, you can change the world. So if you're listening to this and you have an idea, you know, you, you should do it. But life is, is not um, a fully edited movie. It's the uncut version, which means that there's going to be a lot of stuff that like is, is less dramatic and slightly less fun and will need to be redone before you get to the triumphant final. Oh my God. Yeah. I just feel that there is so much of the first four years of felt that will be put together in an eighties montage at this point, you know, <laughs> um, to give you a better sort of idea of it. We made so many mistakes. We made huge mistakes along the line, but what we learn is listen to your community and then the minute we started listening to our community the, the minute we started recognizing that their priorities were not our priorities then we changed and then we grew and then we started working we got contacted by uh the survivors of torture program at uh, bellevue hospital which is the biggest um hospital here at nyu 
and they'd had all their funding cut. They could no longer provide English classes. They could only provide the uh, psychological uh, help for, for survivors of tortures or refugees. So for the first time, we were just like, okay, we're going to allow men into the class. And we had a very strong reason for that. It's because most of the people who had, you know, suffered torture had suffered torture because of their sexuality. And we felt it was particularly cruel to then say, well, you know, but, you know, this is not for you. <laughs> it's like a double-edged sword. So we opened our classes and we kept women's only, only classes if it was culturally relevant. If not, it was a mixed class. And so we were teaching in Bellevue Hospital a few times and then it spread to Brooklyn and it just kept growing and kept growing. But like any, and this comes back to entrepreneurship, <laughs> if you're saying it grew, we said yes to everything and we didn't plan for anything. So we grew way too fast and we just couldn't sustain it. We couldn't <laughs> run the programs. The costs of the programs were extortionate because we had to pay public liability insurance. We had to pay all these things that took us away from the teaching and we couldn't raise enough money because we didn't have the connections, you know, and we made bad choices on our original board and it became unsustainable. So late last year, we decided to close doors, which was so tragic. It was really, you know, and it felt like the worst breakup I've ever had in my life. You know, I really, it really did. Fantastic group of people I worked with, fantastic students who kept in touch with. And then the pandemic ha happened. And we would do regular happy hours with friends who became part of Felt or people from Felt who became friends. We became like this little group. And we kind of toyed with the idea and said, well, why don't we try and put it back online? What's it going to cost us to put it online? Put it's going to cost band us one. Back together. Yeah, it really was the reunion tour, you know, older and wiser and, you know, fatter and all of this kind of thing. So we took it online thinking it wouldn't work because we knew our students didn't have a lot of technology but what we didn't account for is their willingness to want to learn um, and so our classes we rapidly grew in numbers our students were dialing in from like a phone where they could speak on it but nobody could see them you know it was like they were using up all their credit from there they were living in shelters but they were dialing in so we expanded did our, our programming we opened after school programs for kids of our students as well we opened wellness classes for both adults and children um we had a, a reading program for it's called mummy and me story time and it's for basically new mothers who want to read a bedtime story in english but somebody else is reading it and they can read a lot you know that sort of thing and numbers just kept growing and growing and growing because the pandemic also meant that services out there were being cut at a record level. So we were, we partnered with a few more organizations, one that um, works with women who have been trafficked from young age upwards who are looking for English training and job training. So we added programs for that. And a few other organizations in New York City and beyond who um, have students, they can no longer help on a language level, they can help them on many other levels. So we partnered with them as well. And through some connections that we all have, we had a couple of students who were in Turkey who said, well, you know, we would love to be able to learn. We are in a refugee camp, we're high level learners and we would like to be able to teach in this camp. So we started to give them teacher training as well, which has been like a real passion project. Um, We've added a strong training program to our volunteers, which you've been part of, which is exciting. Um, and we've just closed for the holidays, the classes, we're online, but we launched, because this is who we are, we launched a new program this week called Felt at Home. And that's basically where any student who is alone over the holidays, most of them are not, but they can get a conversation buddy and so we put it out there for people you know if you don't want to commit and we've been overwhelmed by both sides wanting to take part in this so yesterday we paired up 42 different pairings of people wow um around america who now you know and not only america because my mother is volunteering from ireland um, <laughs> we joked at first that we were going to call it like felt mama because it was like every volunteer's <laughs> mother who was just like sign me up <laughs> uh, so cute 
So that is launching this week. Every every person's now in the initial touch and it's just an informal check-in conversation time during the holiday period. And it will be helpful, hopefully, for people who are by themselves because their kids can't come home, you know, native speakers as well as non-native speakers. Mm. Um, and then in the new year, we'll be launching some free college programs for 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 the first time ever, not necessarily just immigrant or refugees. It will be first generation low income kids as well. Um, Very cool. Yeah. And that's um, and we do it all in our spare time, which is the, the fun part. <laughs> so, wow. Wow. Yeah. Before so, cool. I forget, uh, where can people find you online? Where can people find Felt New York online? Um, it's feltnyc.org. Um, we're also very active on Instagram and on Facebook as well. We love to interact with people. It's not like a big corporate thing. It's us doing it. It's usually me doing the social media, <laughs> to be quite honest. Again, just like um, an entrepreneur, you got to wear all the hats in the business for a while. And we have, we do have a beautiful, beautiful website. We're so lucky that we had a young volunteer whose mother uh, studied in our English classes, but she um, reached out to us beforehand and she completely redesigned our website. Um, and it's available in English, Arabic, Spanish, French, and in the new year, it'll be in Mandarin as well. Awesome. Um, which is great. So that's felt F as in Frederick E L T N Y C dot org. Yes. Yes. So let's talk about a little bit about this year. How has this year, you know, how have you found the impact of COVID-19 and the kind of the move to online? How has that impacted you, your your work? Um it's really weird because in my real job, it's had a more of a negative impact, you know, because, I mean, I'm lucky in the sense that Renner, well, we were amazing at getting online with our courses. And that's because we're owned by um, the family who own Berkeley College. Mm. And they're the number one online providers of um, education in the US. So when we needed to go online, the infrastructure was there. It was just like, you need 600 laptops. We've got, you know, it was that kind of rapidness. And in fact, we had to teach the training course that was running at the time. So we had less than 24 hours of notice to get online. Wow. Um, we got a phone call at three in the morning that somebody had tested positive in the building and that was it. Um, and we just picked up and we were online, which is fantastic. I think in some ways, New York is doing slightly better than other places because we took a very strong... We, we got hit very badly at the start. Yeah. Um, so even now when numbers are up, our numbers are up for us, but they're really low compared to the rest of the country. Mm. Um, you know, it's, it's, we learn a lot. Surprisingly, New Yorkers were quite compliant, um, which you don't think they are. But I think, you know, like if you live in the middle of a big city and New York, I think it is, if, even if you take away size, just the fact that you can't socially isolate from anyone, just the way that the buildings are built, you know, everything about it. I think mm. people suddenly became aware much quicker of the potential impact. But work-wise, I think, you know, it suffered because everybody's online. You have students who want to study in the US, but why would they pay New York prices when they could, you know, pay Idaho prices? Unfortunately, schools still have to pay their rent. Schools mm. still have to pay their salaries. So it's been a really tough right. point in, you know, so, I mean, it's not that you can suddenly lower your prices or that sort of thing. And lots of schools in New York have closed, um, have closed doors. We, yeah. we haven't. We've been lucky, you know, just from a lot of initiatives. And we were lucky with St. Giles came to us when they wanted to close their, their school in New York and asked us to take on their students. And, you know, so there were certain... Um, point to it we're back open two to, two days a week in person three mm. days online we've been creative in creative well, one thing I would say both work and personal is that we've just our industry is really far behind the times always ah, we're always yes. one step behind the times you know when everybody else was using the mp3s we were still using cds or tapes right yep. it's, it's like the whole thing yeah and this has been the leveler because we can't go backwards. Right. I agree with that. I, I've said that. And, and you know, I, I've said we can't unring the bell. I mean, there is such a thing, you know, like, why would a student pay a lot of money 
to study in New York so that they can be in New York. Like that, that, that is worth the price. But if you are just doing it online, then why do that? You can go to plenty of other schools. That's, I, I think that type of yeah. teaching will return because there's always going to be people who want to have that experience. And I mean, it's a great experience. We've had it. Uh, we know yeah. how wonderful it is. Um, we were but, recently at a conference and they, you know, the number one re like the number one country that students don't want to come to is the U S because of COVID. Right. Right. But the, the number one place that they want to return to when COVID under control is New York. So we all know <laughs> yeah. that if we can just keep in the right direction, you know, it's there's the potential there. Definitely. I, I, I really believe things will be different um, ish, but uh, I, I believe that we're going to see a return of a lot of students um, in the coming, I'm going to say within six months, you know, it's, it's, it's not yeah. going to be immediate, but we're going to, we're going to see return happening. I hope though, that we don't lose everything because I think that there is so much benefit to what we can give students. And, you know, I've noticed in, in trainings I've done and, and working with people that there is a, there's a big difference between some people who are still very much in that, um, this is temporary online space of emergency yeah. teaching. And we should have been out of that by April. Well, <sighs> yeah, but I mean, I, I think that this has been, and you know, some of we've talked about trauma, which is something that you and I are both interested in creating spaces that um, make people who've been impacted by trauma feel safe enough to learn effectively. I would argue that, you know, as, as of this recording, December 22nd, 2020, we are still definitely undergoing trauma. You know, I mean, look, we, there, there are a lot of issues of uncertainty still. There are a lot of people who are still sick right now. Um, all of that adds that in that uncertainty in itself is traumatic. So I think it's going to be a while before we're out of that situation and we can move to less emergency teaching. That's my take. No, I totally, totally agree. And I think that, you know, what I, what I think, what I meant to say, really, I guess I, I explained it slightly better is that as, res, as educators, yes, there's trauma all around. But when we realized that we could do this from home, when we realized that we could deliver these yeah. things online, why didn't we then move into the developmental stage rather than just let's turn up and do it? You know, so we should all be coming out of this with new products, okay, that won't replace the old products. There'll be ads on. But any school that suddenly thinks, well, you know, once we're out of this, I'm never going to have an online program. Well, you're missing an opportunity. For sure. And I actually That's what think I mean there are a lot it. of there are a lot of institutions who've done exactly that. That they've they viewed this as a temporary stopgap measure. And I really yeah. saw it this summer. I did a project where I was doing consultations with schools across Columbia um, on their online programs. And what I really noticed was that some of those um some of those institutions that I was working with, they were very excited about the move to online and they were very active in investing in training and developing materials and all of that stuff. And then there were others who were really looking at this as like the stop gap until they could go back to doing what yeah. they were doing before. And, and my belief is it's the first group that's going to ultimately succeed. And the second group could find itself closing its doors because as I said, you can't unring that bell. There, no. there will be students who, who and, and we know this, there are students who just absolutely respond better to online teaching. And but we that's also not gonna go away. Yeah, but we also should have been online. It sh this shouldn't have been right. a struggle. Right? That, right. I think that that's where I'm at. We look down as an industry. I think that we really look down at online teaching as it never really achieved the same thing. Anyone we can still do, do. It. I think we still do. I think it's changing in many ways. Um, and I think it really depends what it is. I mean, we were really pleasantly surprised because we've been running our SIT courses, teacher training courses, and these are intensive 40 hour a week courses, you know, like the CELTA, very intense. And we have to have an outside assessor come in and she's a very successful doctor of education. She's, you know, she has her own training company and everything. And she was so surprised at the quality and depth that you could achieve in online teaching. 
And I think that there are people who are doing it really, really well. And it's just, they're not singing out about it. Um, You know, my trainers are doing amazing. And, you know, I I put that down to my trainers. Um, Yeah. Oh, I was just going to say, I I think it's still undervalued because not everybody understands what it is. So, so you've got a lot of people who've never experienced online teaching. They just automatically, I don't know. I kind of think that maybe they think of correspondence school. Do you remember like correspondence school? Like you get your assignment in the mail and then you fill it out. Then you write it back or something like that, or like teach yourself this with this book. But we know that's not really what online teaching is, or at least it doesn't need to be that. But the other side is, that I've noticed this with some institutions, they're definitely paying their teachers less to teach online. That in itself says as clear as you possibly can, we don't think this is as good as face-to-face or we don't value this as much as we do uh, face-to-face lessons. Um, and I don't understand why there would be a price differential on those. By, by- I mean, I think, yeah, I mean, I totally disagree with it. I think it's market-driven. I think that, you know, it's a pay- at the moment, it's about keeping your doors open more than anything else. I think it's wrong. I think that the entire way that teachers have been addressed during this um is wrong especially teachers in public school systems yeah like every t- i don't actively teach much that more you know what i mean i mean i'm luxury of that position but every teacher i know is probably working an extra four or five hours a day yes. unpaid to make sure that the lessons are going well and i think that teachers went from you know, at the start of this, it's like, oh, teachers are heroes. They're getting everyone online to right. suddenly like being the demons of this because they don't want to yes. go back into school. Yes. And it, Preach it. Oh, my God. I'm so angry for the teachers. I don't know why they would want to stick in a re- profession that is so disrespected. You know, they're not someone... your kids' babysitters. They're your educators, you know. I heard, um, like, this is like a major news person who said about teachers in New York something like, they want to put their own health above the public good. And I was just like, hey, wait a minute. Is it like staying alive so I can continue to teach maybe also part of the public good? I'm just throwing it out there for you. Like, come on. I mean, it's Um, crazy because in New York, we do have sick pay. You know, that's a big thing. But you don't get it. You know, I mean, it's like, it doesn't last forever and it certainly doesn't pay your way and like right. but everyone has families to take care right. of you know I'm just right. it's it's really weird to me to see how like I, I, the amount of people I've seen online who talk about how difficult it is for them because they're having to homeschool their kids and I'm thinking you're not homeschooling your children you know yes you're guiding them onto online classrooms but they are still with their teacher who is putting in a lot of work and but know, it is hard it is hard for parents it's tough to it's with, tough to be a parent know? but it's not the teacher's fault they're aiming that's at the true. wrong person that's, that's my true. point you know I will I wouldn't want to have cat and dog running around and that's traumatic enough at times <laughs> I, <have a> <laughs> <That's enough. laughs> I mean so. But yeah, I'm kind of angry for teachers. So that's an interesting oh, point, though, about um, the perspective of I'm homeschooling, uh, and and lack of understanding of what that means from an education standpoint, and then also not recognizing that you know the teachers are putting in extra work. It's like the first time you've created a course always takes longer to develop that. Oh my course. god! Yeah. Uh, the the pivot and the um, agility that the teachers have shown over the past. 10 months has been incredible, but a yeah. lot of extra time does go into it. It's a different yeah. way to prepare your course than in a face. Yeah. yeah. And they're also, they are dealing with the trauma themselves. They're dealing yep. with kids who are going through traumatic situations that they've got this added thing going on. I mean, one of my friends works in a school where a number of kids have lost family members through COVID yep. and, you know, or there was somebody else I know who a, a faculty member died of COVID and they had yeah. the kids. I mean, there's there's so much that is I'm I'm kind of in I guess it's kind of controversial because part of me thinks let's just scrap this kit this year for kids let's let kids be I I agree actually and it's funny because we are teachers we know education I you know for younger students for for very young obviously they need socialization like that's that's clearly quite important however anything that they didn't learn in school they can 
Mold can make it up. Also, we set up. these we set these ridiculous targets that at the age of five you need to do this, six right. this, but they are man made. Right. And if it's an entire generation that's going through it, what is the you know what's the problem if suddenly they're allowed extra too. time to do it? I once, just think once it's... upon a time there were no schools, there were no grades. You know, <laughs> like, they just figured. And it we out. managed. You, you know, I mean, me. this is the thing, right? You know, that's I mean, a very Californian. <laughs> what? <laughs> oh yeah. Hey man. Hey man. Let's just have sound baths <laughs> for schools. Um, I mean, you know, I think kids should just the fact that kids are turning up for school and doing the work. Just let you know that's Absolutely. that's it. You know, to then say you're you're failing at this, well, no, come on. No, I agree. I think this is a year of a year that that should be maybe in maybe in upcoming year we will have this. Um, but I would like more compassion and kindness. I think we really really need it. Um, which brings me to the future. What do you think the future has in store for us? I'm actually really positive about what's coming in the future. Me too. Because I think that while so much of the, what's happened this year has shown us the the dark side of humanity, shall we say, um, I think that people are people are much more aware of what's going on around them. And I'm not saying everybody, but the idea that everything's going to change because it's 2021 or because there's a new president is is complete rubbish. You know, I mean, just the the first thing has been put in step, but we still need to fight for what what's coming we're just a bit more positive about where we're going and what we're fighting I think you know I look at things like today I had the the person that they're looking to replace Betsy DeVos with um worked in the public school system he's a, the first Latino public school teacher who's risen for the ranks and that yeah, to me is exciting great. um me too. And I think that education is the same it's tragic that people are losing jobs but I think that there's scope for creativity and I think that, you know, we might see a really exciting time of creativity, be it in I'm hopeful. You know, music, I'm hopeful. art. I mean, just think about the way that people have adapted to be online, like what you guys are doing or, you know, artists who are releasing work or people recording albums. I mean, it's just suddenly in like, we used to always rely on having a recession to make us do that. And then it didn't happen, you know? <laughs> so perhaps the next, and this is aging myself, but maybe the next Sex Pistols are out there um, <laughs> just via Zoom, you know, this time, who knows? Yeah, well, um, probably... But I'm positive. I'm That's positive. great. That's great. Me, me too, actually. Is there anything else you would like to add or or mention um it's wonderful been working with you again definitely i'm looking forward to presenting with you as well yes we're presenting in february at english usa on um trauma-informed spaces uh so yes. which i think is a topic that i believe is going to be getting a lot of attention in 2020 and yeah. and you know i have sent you an email today suggesting that we finally write that book on it Yes, actually, I think to the time has come for that too. Um, yes. and I, I think now is now is truly the time. So, yes. you know, and it's amazing. I think you just see opportunity, 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 and you go forward and you reach out to people and you make things happen. And that's just such an amazing quality. So, thank you for everything oh, you do. Thank you. It's usually through boredom, Amy. <laughs> I always tell people if I wasn't if I wasn't doing all of this thing, I would probably like have gambling debts, you know, because I just sit and play a slot machine. But it's nice because I work with creative people who inspire me. And, you know, I mean, I really can't stress it enough. Felt is wonderful and it really is an amazing organization, but it's an amazing organization because of the volunteers who are part, you know it's everyone gives me the credit for it but it, all I do is say yes a volunteer says I want to launch a program for kids and I say well okay but you do it and they say yeah okay and there it is so you know I mean it's it's um it's about surrounding and I would say this is my final shot for you as a, a piece of career advice as a, oh, you know, that's an, great. an ancient here um is surround yourself by positive creative people because it's not a career that's ever going to buy, buy you a Malibu beachside house, but it will enrich your life. It will, you'll have the best group of friends and creativity that keeps you going throughout if you surround yourself from day one with good creative people. 
brilliant. Thank you so much. Yay. Thank you. Come on, baby. Let's keep in touch. Come on, baby. Let's keep in touch.